PBS. Yeah, you know, I like that. Do the, that's, yeah. uh, that's very highbrow. <laughs> very nice of you. Uh, John spent the weekend in Washington, <clears throat> D.C., so at this point, he hates everybody and everything that ever existed on the planet Earth going back to the beginning okay, of time. Okay, I, I confess I showed up a little cranky this morning, <laughs> but I'm better. I'm better. We had muffins. Or what? Brookies. Brookies. Brookies is what they're called? Yes. Yeah, I hadn't heard that title before. Uh, but cookies and brownies mixed together. It's called a brookie. Yeah. Uh, let's welcome in our first guest, Jennifer Lemon. She is a magistrate in Division Two, running for re-election, and she brought food with her this morning, too. So, brookies. Right. Brookies. It's called a brookie. So we pop the lid off. They smell great, by the way. Uh, if I can point out that Mr. Uh, Stubblefield and Gilstrap have already partaken. Yes. But uh, they, they smell delicious. We learn to get them early, Rob, because yeah. we don't jump early. We don't get one. Yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> don't be spreading those. We lines. don't get one before the show. <laughs> <laughs> that part's true. <laughs> Well, Jennifer, good morning, and thanks for coming in. Good morning. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, who, who told you you should bring food? Um, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's about time the word got out. You know, it's, <laughs> we've really cultivated that. that I thought uh, about bringing wine or you know, an alcoholic beverage, but I wasn't sure how yeah, that would go over. I think that's so, fine, too. Okay, well, I'll remember that for next time. Yeah, what are you, a four-year term? Yes. So let's write that down. 20, Weekly guest. 28. Um, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Uh, so uh, you are a magistrate. You uh, were appointed to succeed Harry Snow's term. Correct. Right? Yes. Uh, tell us the Jennifer Lemon story, where you grew up and how you wound up here and as a magistrate. Um, well, I was born and raised in Iowa. Um, came out here in 20, 2005 with my husband and our two kids. Um, I started in the courthouse, the judicial field. Um, in 1995 in Iowa in Iowa and was there for 10 years until we moved out here and I had to leave my job unfortunately um, and then once out here I worked for the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department for um, seven years as administrative assistant kind of doing the same things that I did as a judicial clerk in in Iowa um, just on the you know on the law side instead of the or in the the police side instead of mm -hmm. the law side um, and then I was asked to um, apply for the position of magistrate assistant for Magistrate Larry Thompson in 2020, and I was um, offered the position and took that and was an assistant for two years, and then um, Harry Snow retired, and I was highly encouraged by Judge Redding to apply for the position as magistrate, and after lots of thinking, praying, um, I decided to apply and I was appointed the position. Why do you want to run for re-election? Um, I enjoy my job. I love my job. Um, I like the process of it. Um, I like the idea of helping people, um, giving people a chance to, um, you know, redeem themselves from what they have done. Um, and I just, I love what I do and I love helping people. And what kind of cases do you mostly hear as a magistrate in Division Two? Um, mostly misdemeanors, um, anywhere from traffic tickets. You know, people will come in and uh, plead guilty or no contest or not guilty to traffic citations. That's a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, uh, they just walk into the magistrate clerk's office and do that. Um, in the courtroom, it's if they plead not guilty to a traffic citation, um, we hear that case. Um, and then misdemeanors from domestic violence, drug possession, um, assault. Um, and then we do hear um, felony cases, and that's just um, if it goes to a preliminary hearing, then we rule over the preliminary hearing, whether there's probable cause or no probable cause to send it to circuit court. And how much leeway do you have over a case that you're ruling on? Is everything, well, this is the rule in the book, and you violated it, therefore guilty? Sorry, that's the way things go. Or do you have a bit more jurisdiction? We have a bit more jurisdiction. You know, we can and we take cues from the prosecutor and the defense attorney. You know, they hash things out a little bit. Um, we don't have to go along with everything that they say. We don't have to agree with it. Um, but usually they give a good argument or and I'm all for kind of, you know, like say someone um, has violated their probation. Mm -hmm. you know, it's their first time, you know, whether they didn't complete their day report center or treatment, um, 
if it's a domestic, they didn't do their CAV, which is um, commutative alternative, you know, battery classes. Um, if they didn't complete that, well, why didn't you? And if they have a pretty good reason, you know, whether they couldn't afford the fees or, you know, logistic reasons they couldn't get there, you know, I like giving people a second chance, mm-hmm. you know. So it, it – um, we we don't have to go by what they recommend. We can say, no, well, I'm going to give you a second chance, you know, but please don't screw this up. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do like giving a second chance because I think everybody deserves it. Okay. So everybody wants to know that's listening right now and in this room, what's the best excuse to get out of a speeding ticket? Take notes here, Gilstrap. I've seen you drive. There is no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time, the officers actually are writing it for less of the speed that they're actually going so they're already getting a break they do that a lot too yes they do they, they do so yeah. they usually do do you get 26 and a 25 coming before you there's kind of speeding tickets i actually have seen you know a couple miles over but they've really actually clocked him probably going 10 or 12 over so um but yeah it is it has happened and some of the other cases i didn't um mention we do hear civil cases as well um, where individuals sue somebody else for, you know, damages or money that they want. And we also do um, wrongful occupation, which is basically eviction. Eviction. Is it difficult to evict a tenant in Berkeley County? Well, for me personally, yeah, I don't like eviction. Well, I mean, legally, from a legal yes, standpoint, yes. what do you have to go through before you can satisfy just file an eviction the, request? Um, just file the petition. Um, there has to be a lease agreement, you know, and usually that's usually what um, – the eviction usually is, is they violated their lease agreement. And number one violation is usually not paying your rent. Do you get squatters issues in front of the magistrate's courts? I've, I've had some emails to ask about uh, what's the rights of the of the owner of a property if they've gone away for a while and they come back and someone's actually squatting in their house. If they are getting mail, receiving mail at the address, um, and there is no lease agreement, that would be an unlawful detainer. And there is there is a process to do that. If they're not receiving mail, um, I would think that l- they should just be able to get them out, use mm-hmm. law enforcement, you know, because that's trespassing or um, illegal entry. I'm sure there's more legal and, um, you know, a crime being committed there. But if they're receiving mail, it would be an unlawful detainer. Billy. Uh, good morning, Jenny. Good morning. Uh, what's the most difficult part of your job? You say you love your job, but is there a part that you you less you love less? Doing interviews for re-election. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is I'm not gonna lie. This freaked me out a little bit, um, but it is going very well. Thank you. <laughs> we haven't asked you to leave yet. It's, well, John, that's good. John hasn't started yet. He's going to ask some tough questions. <laughs> um. Least, well, yeah, being um, woke up at 3.30 in the morning on a Saturday or a Sunday morning to um, go do a search warrant, um, that's probably the least favorite of my job. Um, doing family protective orders um, and having to, to decline a family protective order for an individual, it's not always fun, but there are um, guidelines and parameters we have to follow, um, and sometimes they're just not there, so... Um, you mentioned getting up at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning. Uh, that's when you're on call. Yes. You alternate being on call. Yes, uh, yeah. Every, and, and I'm on call right now. Yeah. And there's uh, six magistrates now and will soon be the seventh come uh, next year? Correct. Yeah. And uh, you're up for re-election. Uh, and uh, you're, there's the six divisions and plus a new one. So you're the only one of the divisions that's that has an opponent at this point in time. As far as I'm yeah. aware of, yes, and I that's am. just kind of the luck of the draw. Yeah. I guess so. I'm yeah. not really sure how that yeah. happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. And how do you go about uh, campaigning for re-election? Because there's, as the, on the judiciary side, there's a lot of things you cannot say. You cannot uh, talk about a platform. Uh, and the circuit judges, as well as magistrates, mm-hmm. are very restrictive on how much they can they can say. How do you how do you campaign for re-election? Well, this is one way. Um, being on the radio, I've um, put an article in the papers, um, and I'll be looking at getting some signs, doing a Facebook page, mm-hmm. and just word of mouth. Yeah, the word of mouth. I uh, uh, This is the first time you and I have met, mm-hmm. but I've heard a lot of good things from your fellow magistrates. They, uh, they seem to think that you're doing an exceptionally good job, and I think all I'm kind of pulling for you as you go through the re-election. Well, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so. 
Is this the first time you've ever had to run for office? Yes, and I will say um, that was the only negative side about when I was deciding whether or not to apply for the position was the election part, because mm -hmm. it it is not a given. Have you done any interviews before? No. So this is your very first this is media first interview? interview? Yes. Oh, you're doing great. Well, thank you. Yeah, nice job. Well, you guys are very, very nice. So far. Go ahead, Gilstrap. My that's, turn. That's why, I, that's why I brought the food. That doesn't hurt, by the way. That doesn't hurt at all. Going back to basics, what is the difference between a magistrate and a judge? I don't have a law degree. Okay. That's the basics. A judge, you know, a circuit court judge, family court judge, they all have law degrees. You do not have to have a law degree to be a magistrate. So in... You hold in fact, you, a second. None of the uh, none of the magistrates right now have a law degree. That is correct. That's we've true. had yeah. we've had magistrates that have been attorneys, yeah. but right now, but none right now, none. And it, it's a trial process, right? There, there's two teams. You got the defense, and mm -hmm. and so when it comes down to objection in in Smith versus Jones in 1947, that we decided such and such. Without the law degree, is that a, is that a problem? I mean, how do you? Um, sometimes it is, um, but that's where you, we don't have to make decisions right away on some things. Um, we can take a moment and like, go look up, you know, the law. Mm -hmm. um, the prosecutor is very good at reminding us what the law is, um, or telling us what it is. Um, most of the time, like on criminal cases, we already have that law in front of us because it's in the criminal complaint and we've already read it. Um, and then it's experience on, and dealing with law so if somebody has been arrested on something like a drunk driving charge mm -hmm. are are you the first non-police officer that they see in in the process of whatever's going to happen to them correct and you set bail and mm -hmm. that's that would be done at the arraignment that's when they get their charges read to them um, what the penalties are and then we decide on the bail and if it is a speeding charge, for example, I, I presume there's a there's a category of offense that goes that is adjudicated by the magistrate as opposed to going to the higher court, the right. circuit court. Right. Yeah, Felon, felonies all go to circuit court. Everything else stays in magistrate court, okay. all mis which are misdemeanors. Anything from a speeding ticket to domestic to your DUI second um, assault charges drug possession charges, simple misdemeanor possession charges. You get into your delivery with intent, that's a felony. We They stay in our court um, until the preliminary hearing. If they waive to circuit court, there's no preliminary hearing. If they want a preliminary hearing that is in magistrate court, then we rule over that, whether we find probable cause or not. Um, if we do, it goes to circuit court. If we don't, then the case is over if there's no probable cause. Does the prosecuting attorney make the initial decision whether something should be charged as a felony or as a misdemeanor? No. Um, the officer files a criminal complaint, and then the magistrates will either find probable cause through that criminal complaint, issue the warrant, or if it's a warrantless arrest, um, which, you know, a DUI, they get arrested for a DUI, that's a warrantless arrest. Re warrant warrantless request and then we still can find probable cause or no probable cause on that as well so if joe smith is arrested for dui and the police want to do a blood test it's an example we discussed off the air mm -hmm. so they get the warrant through you to get the the blood test the blood test comes back is it the same guy who then comes to you in during the arraignment and then comes back to you for the trial yes okay so it's yeah. mm -hmm. tell me about the family uh, type cases that come before you. The only we don't hear family type um, family type cases. Um, basically, the the only thing we hear is family protective orders, mm -hmm. where an individual wants to come in and get a protective order. Um, some people will call them restraining orders, which that's not what they are. Um, we just they come in and they fill out a petition. We review that, um, and then we follow the guidelines and the parameters to determine whether or not it should be granted. And then um, that case is then sent to family court. I see. So what's what's a family protective order, and how is it different than a restraining order? They're basically the same thing. We just don't call them restraining orders. A family protective order is issued um, for people who, and, and the word family is family, whether you're it's husband, spouse, our husband, boyfriend, ex-boyfriend, you know, um, someone that's been living in your household. Um, 
And then we also have a personal safety order, which there is no relationship. There hasn't been, whether it's intimate or um, husband, sister, brother, aunt, uncle, niece, nephew, that type of thing. The, you went through the litany of who it might be. You did not mention a child or children. Child is definitely, definitely involved in okay. there, yeah. yes. So yes. you had mentioned uh, CAV assignments, community alternatives to violence assignments, I presume is what that was? Yes, okay. that's for... Um, d- d- a lot of times in domestic cases and the misdemeanor cases, part of the their plea agreement is um, to take those classes. So the domestic cases do come before you, though. Yes. Okay. But uh, not on, in the not for the protective orders. That's a domestic charge, a criminal charge for domestic. Okay. So, but the ones that do come before you, mm-hmm. what is the limit until they go instead to a, a felony court judge? Um, usually, that's when there's more malicious intent. So just a domestic battery, domestic assault, um, that stays in Mr. in um, the magistrate court. Is it standard that any domestic case that comes in front of you, the uh, perpetrator uh, goes to CAV for a treatment? Most of the time they do. It, it's pretty standard. What is the usual length of that assignment? Uh, the classes, I want to say, are like 12 weeks six or 12 weeks or something like that. I can't remember exactly what their classes are, but they have to take those classes and then like every 60 days, they have to come back to court to make sure they're they're attending their classes. There's productivity in their classes. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, so they do have to come back. Are they separated from their family during the time they're taking tests? Sometimes, and usually, and that will go back to the arraignments. Um, say an individual has been charged with domestic battery and um in our in the bail agreement we can put in there no contact with the victim whether it be you know a sibling a child the wife and then they have to have no contact that can be negotiated in the plea agreement Mm -hmm. um but um there could be no contact until the case is concluded one of the members of our friday panel uh larry schultz is uh, very heavily involved in cav mm-hmm. and we've done interviews with larry and uh, promoted some of the fundraisers they've done on this program and uh do you know uh, by chance what the success rate is with cav honestly i do not i do know that you know the the people will the defendants lack better word um will come in and those who they do get stuff they do get a lot out of it and Mm -hmm. it has been helpful i've had a lot of people tell me you know i've enjoyed it and it has helped oh there's some that just go through the motions and it's they're doing it because they have have to to, sure but there are people who do get a lot out of it i'm curious how the grand jury fits in this scheme of things the trial of the individual or the case first comes to the magistrate and then do you refer something directly to the grand jury or can you go directly to a circuit that is above my knowledge because that's all through um the prosecutor's office so now i i will say our felony cases can go to the grand jury but once they've left our our office it's whether they get sent to the grand jury would be up to the prosecutor or not how about the guns in case of a protective protective order uh is, is any provision to remove weapons from the individual absolutely um all family protective orders um weapons are to be taken by the law enforcement they can be given to a third party but the um, law enforcement agency will vet that third party to see if it's okay Larry Schultz apparently is listening and he uh, or watching and he said CAV classes are 32 weeks. There we go. In duration. Thank you. So Larry, thank you. And uh, Larry, if you happen to know a, a success rate for uh, CAV and the classes and such, uh, let me know. Whatever way that uh, that can be judged. Do you remember your first case when you finally got on the bench? No, but I do have a my first docket framed on my wall. I do mm-hmm. not remember my first case. I think that day was like a complete blur how nervous were you for that first day a little bit it it was just it was daunting only because i was so used to being behind the scenes i was used to getting the files on what had happened now i'm seeing them happen you know first Mm -hmm. um but i think it it went pretty well how does that compare to being the first time on radio (laughs) this was a little scarier (laughs) 
I'm not going to lie. Well, now, in previous jurisdictions where I've lived, I don't know if it's the actual law, if it was just the practice, but it was. I have an emergency response background myself, and the rule was if, if the police show up for a domestic violence case, somebody's going to jail. You don't leave domestic violence case without somebody being hauled off. Is that the way it is here as well? From what I'm seeing, yes. I mean, if, if law enforcement shows up for a domestic, yeah, someone's usually going to get arrested. And does that always lead to a criminal process, or is it sometimes just... Uh, how has it turned out that somebody gets really, really mad and then calls the police and then says things that aren't necessarily true? And is that what then comes out, I guess, during the trial? Yeah. And But this is after the arraignment and... Mm -hmm. Yes, because I mean, it, it's law enforcement's job to de to determine who's going to get arrested, you know, and in some cases, both get arrested. You know, one person calls and it's um, undetermined, you know, who's the instigator, who's who's one more at fault. Um, and then sometimes they both get arrested. And then in that case, if there are children involved, are where do you fall into? Where do the children, if both mom and dad are, are, are going to jail? the disposition of the children into the foster care system is that in your shop as well no that would be law enforcement because then they would have to call cps and or call family members for the children to go someplace else one of our loyal uh listeners and commenters asked more about the guns going back to uh, uh protective uh orders are, are guns automatically removed or the provisions how do you determine if a gun sh uh, or weapon should be removed from an individual they're always taken All, automatic, oh, yeah. automatically in a yeah. family protective order. They are automatically taken. How, how long are they held? Until, well, family court would then determine if, like, say, once it goes to family court, whether the petitioner um, doesn't show up or he or she wants to not go for go on with the case um, or the family court judge um, finds that there's no, they dismiss it because there's no grounds for a family protective order, mm -hmm. then the respondent would have to petition to family court to get their guns back. So if if dad is the one for whom the protective order is written, does mom have to give up her guns too? Probably not because, well, dad wouldn't be in the household anyway, but there would, yes, because there can't be any guns in the household. In the house, okay. Yeah. So the guns would all have to go. No one would be able to have them. How does this differ from the red law, uh, uh, red flag laws, which we do not have in West Virginia? I don't know a whole lot about the red law. Yeah. Red flag law. Rob, you have any sense? I have to think about that for a moment, but I think red flag law is you, there doesn't have to be an adjudication of wrongdoing. Red flag law is where you call and you say. Uh, my mom or my dad is having suicidal thoughts, and then they come and, and they take the guns based on that. I, I believe that's the difference. You may well, anticipation more right. so than actual. Uh, well, there's, uh, there, there's no magistrate hearing before. Well, that I don't know. Yeah, I, don't, there, I don't know the there, steps. I think there is a magistrate hearing. So I, th I thought there was, yeah. but I'm not 100. percent But I don't certain. think as, as what we're talking about here is that there is alleged wrongdoing mm -hmm. that's that's being adjudicated. In this case, there's a, the potential, as I understand it, there's the potential for wrongdoing that would would um, kick in the red flag laws, and that's why they're so controversial. It gets into, yeah. you know, what are people thinking and what but are their I, intents. I think it is referred to a magistrate before. Decision. It could very yeah. well be. I, I don't I know the logistics. It was. Yeah. Jennifer Lemon is our guest, the Division II magistrate looking for re-election. She was appointed to succeed Harry Snow uh, during his term, and she'd like another four-year term as well. And Jennifer, we're down to about a minute or so so i'd like to turn that over to you if you want to talk to our listeners and viewers and tell them why they should vote for you for re-election uh well i would appreciate your vote i love what i do um i've been doing it for close to almost two decades and and you know at some point some facet of law whether it be on the law side or the judicial side um i want to help people i want to make Berkeley County a safe place. I raised two kids in Berkeley County. Um, hope someday, not in the near future, but in the future have grandkids and hopefully they'll be in Berkeley County. And I just want Berkeley County to be a safe place for everybody and want to give everybody a chance um, to right a wrong if they have done a wrong. Um, and I would really appreciate your vote. I love what I do. I like the way you set up the grandchildren thing because 
all parents would say the same thing at a certain age, right? I'd like to have <laughs> yes. grandparents. Not too soon. <laughs> no. Everybody careful out there. Right? Think of the pressure. You're a teenage driver, and you know if you screw up, you're going to be in front of grandma. <laughs> <laughs> Or mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jennifer, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been it's been fun. Thank w- you. What did you think? Give yourself a grade. How'd you do? Uh, I'll give myself a B plus. B plus? Yeah. yeah. I thought you did pretty Man, well. You're and, tough. and you brought food. That that moves up to an A. Right there. That's <laughs> a solid right. A. Well, thank you. <laughs> Good job. Thank, thank you, Jennifer. You. This segment of our program today brought to you in part by WVU Medicine, Berkeley Medical Center, Jefferson Medical Center, leading healthcare here and everywhere. 